Welcome to the Female VC Lab podcast. My name is Barbara Bickham, and I would love for you to introduce yourself in one line. Give me your name, your title, and the name of your fund. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Claire Chang, founding partner at Ignite XL Ventures. Wonderful. Thank you, Claire. So what inspired you to become a venture capitalist or uh, an investor? I think there are two things that I can talk about. One uh, is the fact that I am passionate in helping others. And I believe that comes from the fact that I myself have been a beneficiary of being helped by many others. I'm an immigrant uh, child. I came here with my family when I was 12 years old. None of my family members spoke a word of English. And so you can imagine from settling in to going to school, learning our ways through, we had to rely on helps from many um, others. So that's one. Having been a a single mom with two children working full time. That's another one. Absolutely. Relying on family and friends to fill in, taking care of the kids, right. um, being filling in that father's role and just being mentor. It takes a village to raise a child. And I think working full time as a single mom, there's no way you can do this by yourself. Absolutely. So not. Having experienced that, the beauty of getting help has made me want to help others just as in return. So that's one. And of course, if you've and all of us have had experience of helping others and the feeling that you get, the rewarding feeling that you get when you know that you have made an impact or difference uh, in others. I think that is what keeps you wanting to uh, be that helping hand when there's a call for it. Second thing I would say is the fact that I love working with passionate uh, um, startup founders. Uh, mm-hmm the energy and the passion that they exude is really contagious and addictive. Um, You know what? I'm glad you said that because it is very addictive. It can be addictive. That's a good word for it. (laughs) (laughs) It is, right? Many in the media, we see all these shining lights on these unicorn startup founders, but many of the founders, we struggle. The founders struggle. The the failure rate is... Mm -hmm very high, north of 95%. 90, 90 some percent. 90, right? It's not a, it's a very tough and sometimes lonely journey. Yes. Um, and I think I read most recently that startup founders are two times more likely to uh, suffer from depression, wow. twice more likely to suffer from uh, suicidal thoughts, mm-hmm. three times more having substance abuse. And they get this, 10 times more um, likely to uh, be suffering from bipolar disorder. I was like, 10 huh. times more. Wow, that's so interesting. That's extreme. But that's at, really at the same time, I think you can also see that because I, yes. when you're a founder, you have to constantly put on this face of being confident. And, and, and at the same time, you're going through an internal battle of self-doubts and all these struggles that you're going through, but you can't show that up front. I can see... That, yeah, that bipolar. Uh, the, the pressure. You know, there's, a, there's a constant pressure there right. as a founder, you know, right. Right. A constant pressure. And uh, that can uh, lead to many of those issues you discussed. So thank exactly. you for bringing that up, Claire. And, and yet you have these founders that are just, you know, absolutely passionate in working on the, the solutions, products, because they believe that they're solving a problem. Mm-hmm. And that the world would be a better place with this solution. I know myself having gone through a personal experience of being in a startup where I was one of the, the 16 members, five engineers, one female. We mm-hmm. were literally sleeping, eating, working in you know right. one office, really just excited at what we were working on. We, we really truly believed that this was going to change the world. You know, that whole the HBO Silicon Valley right. <laughs> is very true. You, you, right operate with this notion that you are doing something so important. You're so zeroed in what you're working on. It's that passion. And then also, I think I started a global accelerator back in 2014. I was helping entrepreneurs from Korea to expand to the U.S. markets. I worked with over 200 founders where 
I got to experience these amazing, resilient founders. They had language barrier, cultural barrier. They weren't sleeping just because they needed to get ahead uh, to compete with the local founders here. Mm -hmm. And none of that, none of those challenges stopped them from what they wanted to do. And having worked with them over and over again, understanding the, the kind of challenges that they faced, but they were relentless uh, in their pursuit of getting the products uh, and solutions to the market. And it was through that experience, the understanding the need for capital. As an accelerator, we were connecting them to the customers, partners, mentors, investors. But at the core, you needed the capital, the capital, yes. the key resources that these founders needed. So back in 2019, I decided, okay, I love working with founders, but I can't, in order to be relevant, in order to be sustainable, I need to create a fund. I need to go raise money so that I can continue to do what I love, which is to support founders. And so rather than, oh, I want to become a VC, it was more of, I need to create a fund to, be able to infuse capital into these Correct. startups. So have to move those passions of those startups and those founders forward. That's great. That's great. Thanks so much for that, Claire. So tell me a little bit about your investment thesis and the motivation behind your investment thesis. Sure. So our investment, we're very excited about this future of beauty and wellness. Our investment is we're a global seed fund investing in the, uh, igniting the kick-ass entrepreneurs. We, we, we say that unapologetically, kick-ass entrepreneurs at the intersection point of technology, beauty, and wellness. And we are uh, targeting pre-seed and seed stage okay. um, companies. Okay. We are global. Um, we are U.S. We are we are based in the U.S., mm. but our belief is that beauty and wellness is global, uh, yes. and that the innovation can come from really anywhere. And so we have made investments in Brazil, U.K., of course U.S. Um, as well as Asia, and we also have a strong ties uh, in Asia, especially Korea, Japan, China, where we have connections to manufacturers, to distribution partners, to up customer insights where we add value to the founders that we back. That's great. That's our investment uh, thesis. Why are we so excited about this industry? Um, yes. We really start with the premise that the beauty um, is not just skin deep, but that it is, it's much more holistic, that it's inside out, that it includes mind, body, soul. Mm -hmm that we're really looking at this through the lens of health and beauty. And when you look at, and, and when you look at these three uh, things, one, on the consumer base, we have Gen Z's that are really redefining the definition of beauty. Again, it's, it's not just, again, covering up, but it's really being authentic, self-confident, and that's really inside out. Your health, well-being is really at the core. Mm -hmm. um, they're also beauty means conscious, right? They demand the the the, the, the clean ingredients, cruelty free. They want sustainability, um, mm -hmm. which this demand is really changing what kind of products are being produced. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Absolutely, and they also demand the authenticity that you can't just say one thing clean. Uh, beauty products, but then go on and do something that's completely opposite of what you say you do. You have to be authentic, authentic inside out. And also the fact that we have information everywhere, that consumers are checking, they mm -hmm. have access to all their information now. And so you can't be, you can't be lying. I think the transparency is really at the core. Uh, and you then know, that's a that's a good point, Claire, mm -hmm. as far as the transparency, because you're right, you can go and Google all these different ingredients and see, is this really healthy? Is this good for me? How would this apply to me as an individual? Can it create problems? So the transparency piece is very important, which goes along with the authenticity as well, in combination. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And really, um, and technology really is at the core. I'll talk about the technology as the, the second piece. But again, adding to this consumer demand, there's also the speed to market, right? Speed. Mm -hmm. So consumers are constantly engaging with these uh, brands, companies, yeah. founders, constantly uh, communicating what, what they want to see. 
and brands are listening, right? They have all these tools that they have a feedback loop to uh, tools in place to engage with consumer base, understanding what their needs are, constantly iterating and getting yes. the products to market. Whereas I yes. think in the past, specifically in the beauty space, it would take anywhere from 24 to 36 months, and that's considered pretty fast to get the product out to market. Now we're talking about anywhere from four weeks to as quick as four weeks, all the way to six months. So we we're yeah, seeing that's really fast. Sh shortage uh, mm -hmm. of time, how the products are delivered to the market from the uh, conception to actually being out in the market. So that's, that's a big, of, that's a big evolution. Very, uh, mm -hmm. really big. And I think that that's a whole different topic in terms of how is that, you know, possible I right. think the manufacturing, um, based and then the, the consumer communication and brands that can really move fast. And I think that's where that beauty of all these up and coming companies, startup founders that are really able to act quickly. Again, then I think, I think you're going to add in the technology piece as well, which I think can help inform not only from the data, but also from the deploying of the product from concept to, to shelf. Because exactly. before it would take a long time and a lot of chemists and all, and I, there wasn't as much technology to help inform those the creation of those products as well. Exactly. I think technology is really at the core of this change uh, transformation in that consumers, of course, how they're communicating their needs and demands to the brands and brands having this technology capability to listen to you know, all these tools that you know, even what you had talked about with podcasting, you know, all these technology tools that's, yes. that's enabling me to do this, but also in terms of augmented reality, a, uh, augmented reality like yes. AR tools where you can actually see Those are huge. before you buy. A ton of data that we're collecting now that enables these brands to really understand customer behavior. Yep. Right. And then on the manufacturing side, like you said, before people are still having to travel to, you know, go to the fact, the manufacturer, of course. see the product, but much of that process can be automated leveraging technology. So mm -hmm. I think that's really at the core of this transformation. And that's where we also are very excited about how the beauty, the wellness category will products and services and experiences will be reimagined, I think, leveraging yes. technology. I like that reimagined. And then the third thing why we're so excited is the fact that when you look at this consumer, the personal care market, 80% of the product purchase decisions are made by female. Absolutely. Right? Yet, when you look at the investment uh, landscape, over 90% of the investors who are writing checks are male. Correct. And so many times. And there's a lot of disconnecting there. It's a exactly. big disconnect. And so we have so many comments from our female investors, female uh, uh, founders, where if I hear one more word about, I'm going to have to call my wife and ask <laughs> to all these crazy instances where they're trying to explain the value of the the. The product and how it's useful and how it's different than XYZ's product. Yeah, that's you know, tough. Trying to explain that value proposition to investors who really have no idea because they're not the they're not the the buyers. They're not the the consumers that consume, or they do, but then they're not the buying decision. They don't value. So they don't right, have, right. They don't have that intimate understanding of the problem and the solutions as females. Correct. And as a fe all female led team here in Silicon Valley, we're, we're the first Silicon Valley based female led team to really tackle this beauty and wellness uh, space now for investment. Wow, that's, that's really great because that what you said was so critical, having that understanding and the understanding from an investor perspective, like that's the difference between getting the funding and not getting the funding potentially only because of understanding and that's good you're like bridging the gap of that because i think that's really cool that's what excites us about what we do wonderful claire what are you currently learning or listening to or reading these days <laughs> when i'm not talking to founders and when i'm not fundraising um you know yeah. like when you're I, not doing that stuff there's so much to learn. There's so much. And I don't come from this investment uh, background. And more so that I feel I need to learn uh, as fast as I can. 
I think the biggest misperception out there about investors, especially when you're going from an angel investor to actually running a fund, is that running a fund is like running a company. There's so much yeah. <laughs> operations. 100%. And I think that's something that is not often talked about because I think on the facade, you just think about, oh, you just select the companies that you are excited about and you invest. More to it than that. <laughs> <laughs> so much more to it. Wish it was that simple. <laughs> I know, I know. With that, obviously, I am just trying to learn as much as I can from experienced seasoned investors, the best practices, obviously not just from investing, but fundraising to operations, all of it really. And so listen to all the VC related podcasts you can imagine. And VC and lab is, is one, another one that I'm going to add to my uh, Please podcast. add that on. We have some all different <laughs> kinds of female VCs on there. Yeah, no, the that's VCs. for sure. And then of course, I listen to the usual the VC 20 by Harry Stebbins. Yeah, Harry Stebbins. The, good. Yep. Yeah, it's great. Arlen has a good, Arlen uh, Hamilton has a good podcast as well. That Backstage. I can tell. Yeah, okay. she has a very good podcast as well. And then, of course, Jason Kokanis has a very good podcast as well. Sure. For, uh, just on I angel investing and investing. Right, right. Yeah, he's got a good one as, as well. I got the full ratchet by Nick Moran as well. The full uh, ratchet, that one's good as well. That's also <laughs> good. Venture Stories, I think Village Capital also puts out good one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, just in terms of startups related, A16 and NFX, those are some of the ones yeah. that I also listen yeah, to those as are well. Good. Yeah. And then I would say, I think, being a how do I be a how do I be a, a better investor? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what what entails as a, a good investor is being able to really support the founders because ultimately our success, a, a startups, um, the founders have to be successful in order for us to be successful. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, how do we help these founders? And I think the, the podcast and the readings that I've done, you've got to be able to ask the right questions. And so yes. a lot of it, I think, but also being able to tune in to understand the state of the founder as well, not just from a mm. business perspective, but also at their personal level. Are they actually personally like, okay, are they doing okay? And being yes. able to gauge these details requires, I think, training. And it's almost, I feel like it's, investors also have to learn to be life coaches, business coaches and life coaches. Uh, I, I agree at some level because we're creating these long-term relationships. They're longer term, five years, seven years, 10 years, could be 15 years. So y you have to ask yourself a question on both sides, the founder has to ask, and we have to ask as venture capitalists and investors, can we help these people long term? And then, like you said, uh, people are whole entire people. They're not just one piece. Your work is one piece of many pieces and aspects of you. So checking in on them and making sure you have the compassion, the empathy, see how they're doing, see where they're at, see where their head, head is at. If you happen to see some things happening, when do you come in? When do you have them speak with you? When do you have them speak with other people? Create, and then you're creating your ecosystem. Maybe you have some mentors that, that do these things. So it's important to look at it as a holistic thing and not just, hey, I'm just giving you this money. Exactly. No, it's so important. I recently had an experience where I was speaking with the founder and you as an investor, you're always uh, being a cheerleader, yes. encouraging them, really also pushing them as well. Mm -hmm. And I had a debriefing session with this uh, founder and she alerted me because I had, how did I do, you know, in my enthusiasm, did I just push too much? And she did uh, talk, talked about how loved enthusiasm, but at the same time, she was just completely burned out. She was burned out that she wasn't in the state of mind to be able to take on the, all the things that I was recommending. Right. And so it was a big aha moment for me to say, ah, yes, you want to be, you want to be encouraging, you want to be pushing, but also I need to be a better listener to understand that particular founder was burnt out and I need to listen and be able right. to recognize that and to be able to tell her that it's okay. It's okay to pause and take a break. Correct. And, and that's a part of the relationship building that, that, that we do. And it's also part of the trust and things we create with these founders that they can have that authenticity and transparency with us and creating that safe space to go okay you can say this in here 
be honest about your feelings. We're sorry, and we'll deal with this in another time. Because like you said, maybe they need the break. Okay, we can deal with this in another time. Or maybe they can only do one or two things. And go, okay, great. We knock these two out and then we'll come back with these other X, you know, X number later. Some of it's listening. Some of it's like making sure that we're open to it. And right. then some of it too is like allowing them to give us feedback as well. Yeah, no, I think that it's, it actually, I had to reach out and say, hey, I want to have a, a, a chat with you. I want to ask you, how did I do and that's how the, the alertness came in. And you're absolutely right. Being able to ask the founder, how am I doing is also right. important, right? Because it's not just one way. It should be always. It can't, it can't be one way. It's right. not one way because it's not one way. No, it's not. It doesn't work that way. That's not how relationships work. <laughs> no, no. And yeah, often they think that it's investor and founder relationship is one way and it should be absolutely both ways. No, it won't work if it's one way. So Claire, this is great. So here's your bonus question. <laughs> if, if in a in a year or two from now we're sitting down and we're looking back, what, how do you see venture or investing or cre fund creation evolving in like the next year or two? You know, I am very optimistic. I had mentioned how the investment landscape, investor landscape right now being predominantly male. Mm -hmm. with with what you're doing really highlighting yeah. female vcs mm -hmm. with an organization like all race uh, yes i'm familiar with them as well we have women in vc we have mm -hmm. number of these organizations that are really trying to promote and bring together these female investors there are many works in front right uh, in the works now that i think in uh, in one to two years we'll definitely see the numbers. That's great. Moving towards more positive number, more increase in female GPs that can write checks to support more diverse founders. I believe, I, I, I am very hopeful with all the activities that's going on with Black Lives Matter. I think really highlighting, really giving us also, it gave me time to reflect and think about, okay, what sourcing channels do I have working with Black founders, how many do I have? Like actually quantifying the, the sourcing channels, yeah. reaching out to my connections to say, hey, how do we create this channel where we're in regular talks that we're regularly reviewing and meeting with founders? With all of these things, I'm hopeful that in two years, we'll, we'll, the landscape will change. I, I, I believe that as well. I think it'll take, it's going to take time. It took time it for it to get this way. So it'll take time to, to change it. But I don't know. It may be fake. It always seems like it takes a long time. And then like five years from now, we're looking, we're like, wow, look at what happened. And I feel like we're I'm hopeful as well. Point. Yeah. I I'm feel like we're at that inflection point and that we will see that change going, going towards the right direction. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, Claire. So how do people get in contact with you, Claire? My email is just on our website. Every, so it's easy. Just Claire at IgniteXL.vc. So email, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all of those um, channels work. Wonderful. I'd love to talk to you. So thanks so much, Claire, for coming on to the podcast. Claire from IgniteXLVC. And thank you for being our guest on the Female VC Lab podcast. Thanks so much. Congratulations on launching this podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.